Hey everybody, welcome to a special crossover episode. This is episode 111 of Waking Up to Narcissism and episode 419 of The Virtual Couch. So actually, if you do the math, we got 111, 419, maybe throw 20 episodes of Love ADHD in there, 15 of The Mind, The Mirror, Me, I don't know, maybe a dozen of Murder on the Couch, Carry, Carry the 12, and that is roughly 572 episodes of podcasting. Or for my Waking Up to Narcissism audience, using narcissistic math, that is well over 10,000 podcast episodes. So thank you for joining me. Now, why a crossover episode today? There's a couple of reasons. One is the topic of today, Death by a Thousand Cuts. These episodes are ones that resonate so much with people on the Waking Up to Narcissism side, but I also have people on the virtual couch side of the coin that have talked about going over and listening to these as well. And for my virtual couch audience, the Waking Up to Narcissism podcast is actually quite a bit bigger than the virtual couch podcast, which I never anticipated. And they do hit different demographics when you really break down the where they go and the numbers. So I just thought, why not? Why not bring all my friends together today to listen to to today's podcast? So that's one reason that the Death by a Thousand Cuts episodes are pretty fascinating. And, and today's has so much content. And yeah, there are examples that are heartbreaking. And there are some that are just fascinating and will probably resonate with a lot of you in your relationships, but not even necessarily, I guess, in your relationship, but you may not even be aware that there are people around you that you care about that are also in these relationships with emotionally immature or people that have uh, strong narcissistic traits or tendencies. And hopefully this will help give you even more empathy and the opportunity or ability to connect with some people that might be struggling. Or again, you might be struggling in your relationship as well. Now, reason number two, this is moving week. We're, we're headed to Arizona. And on that note, I had never done this or I never have on a podcast. So we'll see how this goes. But um, first of all, sign up for my newsletter at TonyOverbay.com or in the link tree in the show notes here. And then speaking of my newsletter, this is kind of part of that segue. A couple of weeks ago, I mentioned to my newsletter audience about this move. And then at the end, I threw in there a little bit of a, hey, I might actually have have been able to open up some space to have a handful of new virtual clients and the feedback was really, it was really wonderful, but I just wanted to put that out there here as well. So if you resonate with the material that I put out, either as a couple or as an individual, feel free to drop me an email at contact at tonyoverbay.com or go through my website and tell me a little bit more about your situation. I can't promise anything, but if I can help, I would love to see if that might be a possibility. And I also have two amazing associates, Nate and Marla Christensen. Yes, they are married and they are both therapists. Insert joke there. Marla was on the Virtual Couch podcast a couple of weeks ago talking about grief and loss, but she can work with a variety of things. And she has some some strong relationship skills from some of the things that she's been through in her background. We talk about that on that virtual couch episode. And then Nate has been on, I think the virtual couch half a dozen times also over on waking up to narcissism and he works with addiction and ADHD, anxiety, depression. So if you're looking for help and just not sure where to go, just reach out to me and, and I'll see what I can do. But just a quick heads up too, before we dive into today's episode, it should be dropping on Tuesday, March 19th. So if you, if you like, watching things live and you got a TikTok account or YouTube, then you're in luck because my daughter Sydney and I are gearing up for our next relationship Q and A session. And that is on this Wednesday, March 20th at 7:30 PM Pacific time. And you can catch that on uh, TikTok live or on, on uh, YouTube live. And then you can always catch the replays on my YouTube channel. So talk about death by a thousand cuts. We hear that phrase often, and it actually comes from this old, harsh punishment called, uh, I think it's Ling Chi out of China. So if you, to set the stage, picture this, it's a, it's a slow, painful process where the person got these tiny little cuts, basically paper cuts over and over until it was just too much. But now we're not talking about physical cuts, but emotional and psychological ones that come from dealing with someone who's struggling with emotional immaturity or maybe showing some narcissistic traits and tendencies. And what this can start to look like is sarcastic comments or a cold shoulder here and there. And what is really difficult is those may not seem like a big deal on their own, but you start to pile them up. And we're talking day after day, year after year. It can even be decade after decade. And they really do start to wear a person down. It starts to chip away at who you are. It messes with your head. And pretty soon you start to feel all alone in your own relationship 
but yet also questioning, is this something that I'm causing or creating, or is it all in my head? Or the person that's the more pathologically kind that's trying to make sense of things will often say, wait, am I the emotionally immature person? Am I the narcissist? But here's the deal, because I do want to, I want to validate those feelings. They are real, the feelings that you're having. And those small cuts, they are anything but small when they start to pile up. So as we start to dive into more of the stories today, well, you're going to hear a lot of those moments that really did leave a mark. And we'll talk about how we can start patching ourselves up, how we can start standing strong again. And so often we, we just don't know what we don't know. Now we're here and we're starting to learn more about something that we weren't aware of. And that can be a really difficult place to be when you start to wake up to this emotional immaturity, whether it's in yourself or in your relationship, because it can often then feel like, well, now what do I do? But what you do is you just, you keep doing and being and listening to podcasts like this and you're on that, that path of enlightenment. Let me also address before we jump into the examples, why we often feel dismissed when trying to share some of these small cuts, because let's say that you have tried to share these with, and let's not say maybe necessarily the person that's inflicting those cuts upon you, because I'm sure that you've tried to do that already, but you start trying to share them maybe with uh, a sibling, an adult sibling, maybe a pastor, a, a bishop, a leader, a friend. Because sometimes we just want to feel heard. If we feel like we're being made to feel crazy within our relationship, that's one of the first things we need to do is say, am I, am I crazy? I need to reach out to somebody. And especially if it's somebody that I think that I can trust, but then if they invalidate us, you know, we want somebody to tell us that, hey, we're going to be okay, or, or I see you. I know that we need to find that okayness from within. I mean, that's a big part of becoming is that you do need to eventually find a way to know that you're okay, not need that external validation, but that is a process. And that one ebbs and flows with your own mood and what's going on in your life. But we'll get to that point where you have that okayness from within. It's really difficult if you're in a relationship where you're starting to bleed out from these cuts. So when you do try to open up to your friends and family about the little things that maybe your partner does that it is really starting to hurt all those little small comments and actions that again, don't seem like much on their own but they add up over time. So you finally decide, okay, I'm gonna share this with somebody. I'm hoping for a bit of understanding, maybe even a shoulder to lean on, but instead you get things like, well, hey, it could be worse, or, oh no, I totally get it. My partner does the same thing. And then just like that, the focus shifts and it's not about you anymore. It's about them making themselves feel better about the conversation. I know that people are trying in that scenario. They feel like they are doing something good by telling you, hey, don't worry about it, as if you hadn't thought about that or as if somebody telling you not to worry about it, then all of a sudden your, your fight or flight response calms down. Your body no longer keeps the score and you can just go back into the relationship and say, eh, I guess it's not so bad. They are trying to help, but in doing so, they start to make it about their own comfort of getting rid of their discomfort, not about what you're going through. And that's from an absolutely bless their heart standpoint. But here's the thing, it's human nature to want to fix things, especially when we're faced with somebody else's discomfort. If you're a parent and your kid comes up to you and they, they are really sad, what do we want to do? We want to say, hey, don't worry about it, bud. It's not a big deal. Or, well, what did you do as part of that, this, this situation that you're coming to me with that you're upset about? Or, hey, not right now, or just take a couple of deep breaths, or we can even be doing it from a place of good, but what we're doing is invalidating that person because quite frankly, it makes us uncomfortable. You know, it's, it's like if we can offer this quick solution or make it seem less serious, then we've done our part. It's all I can do, but that's not always what we need. It's rarely what we need. Sometimes all we're looking for is to be heard, to have somebody acknowledge that what that they're going through is tough without trying to brush it off or compare it to their own experiences. No fixing your judgment statements, not, well, why didn't you, or I would have, or you need to tell them, but just that sounds hard. It really does. So that's why having a space where we can share and really listen to each other is so important. You know, it's not just about talking, it's about feeling that feeling understood and really feeling validated. And if I'm being real, finding that kind of support, it can be an absolute game changer. And that's what starts to remind us that we're not alone and feeling this way and that our experiences do matter. So if you're listening on the virtual couch side or wherever you are, I have a, a private Facebook group for women who are in emotionally immature or narcissistic relationships with, it can be anyone with an adult, a parent, it can be an adult child. It can be their spouse. It can be somebody at work. It can be a neighbor. It can be a pastor. It can be, you name it. And then I started a men's group, which I've called emotional architects. We're, we're learning how to become more emotionally mature 
and more emotionally consistent. And so that, if you're interested in either one of those, reach out, contact at TonyOverbay.com. So if you never heard one of these episodes before, buckle up, listen with an open mind because you might not be the one getting cut or doing the cutting, but the chances are that somebody around you that you know is living in one of these types of relationships and emotional immaturity knows no gender. Yes, there is a small study out of the University of Buffalo that looked at about half a million participants over 30, a 30-year 30 period that showed that men are more narcissistic or emotionally immature than women. And if you're newer to the narcissism angle or if you hear it being thrown out a lot, just know that on my Waking Up to Narcissism podcast, I'm very intentional about recognizing that if you're just listening to the general populace, the zeitgeist or what people are talking about, it probably feels like 80% of the population is narcissistic. When in reality, a, a diagnostic criteria for narcissistic personality disorder is most likely met by maybe three to four, maybe four and a half percent of the population. So that's where I'm, I've hung my, my shingle, my sign, my hat on. Actually, we're, we're all emotionally immature until we're not. And those, those symptoms of emotional immaturity are a lot of what do we do with our discomfort? Can I sit with that discomfort? Am I willing to self-confront? Can I, can I apologize? Can I take ownership for things? And not just from a people-pleasing standpoint, but can I do that as a way to grow, even if the person that I'm communicating with or in a relationship gets frustrated? Because typically we want to eliminate their frustration to make me feel better. And that is more of that emotional immaturity. Is a boundary more of an ultimatum? Hey, I need you to not do that anymore, which in reality, I'm just challenged that person versus what a real boundary is, is if you do that, then I will leave. I'll go on a walk. I'll do something other than be here because that isn't going to be met with somebody saying, okay, I respect that. You know, typically we're in these relationships where the more pathologically kind is with the more emotionally immature. And, and the reality is, that means we're both pretty immature, but then uh, when somebody starts to change the dynamic in the relationship, the other person doesn't typically uh, throw a party and get balloons and party hats. They start to push new buttons to try to get you to react because if you all of a sudden get better or start to be more emotionally consistent or mature, which is our goal as we grow into a mature adult human beings, it can threaten the safety in the relationship for the person that, that all they know for love is control or manipulation or coercion. If that's the case, if you find yourself in any of these sides, you're that pathologically kind person, or you're the person that's starting to wake up to maybe more of your own emotional immaturity, you're in the right spot. So let's, let's get to these stories. So what I like to do in these death by a thousand cuts episodes is I will read these stories. The stories have come from people that have emailed in since the last death by a thousand cut story, or people are listening to the back catalog and I get a lot of these emails. And then I also put a request out to the women's Facebook group. So these are all based on real life experiences. And then I have gone in and asked for permission. So at times I think people maybe have changed up a, a few of the details just to protect confidentiality, but they are based off of real stories. And I think here's our first quick emotional immaturity check that as you're hearing these, if your first thought or reaction is I'm not buying it, it's kind of fascinating because you don't know these people or their experiences. And as somebody that sits and gets to do the couples therapy with people that are in emotionally immature relationships or people with narcissistic traits and tendencies, the stories are pretty, pretty wild. The things that people do to control or coerce or manipulate another human being. So again, quick check. If you're saying, Oh, I don't know if I buy it. That is a you thing in a loving way from a differentiated standpoint. So let's, let's get to these stories. So the first person said, he used to make sweeping generalizations about groups of people. When I disagreed, he said I was being argumentative for the sake of it. Because remember, to the narcissist or the extremely emotionally immature, you can't have a different opinion because if you do, then you think that theirs is wrong. Even if that's not what you're saying or conveying in this scenario, he's already observed you disagreeing and then he has quickly made the judgment that therefore you think that you are better than him. All or nothing, black or white thinking. Honestly, it's like everything is a game, that there must be a winner and there must be a loser, but we're not playing the, I guess it would be a real live game of life where it's almost like we're playing a board game because there has to be that winner. There has to be somebody in this one-up position. And what that does in the relationship is it eliminates curiosity. It eliminates connection. It's all competition. And one of the stranger things still is that he also most likely thinks that you will now be impressed that he can speak with such authority about something while trying to also destroy you emotionally, which then 
actually only makes him feel better. But now you're also supposed to say my hero and you're probably supposed to desire him and you'll get that wrong too. So anyway, back to this example, she said he would never value my opinion and he used to use random people on the internet to back up his views. So then I don't know if I have just become more healthy egoed or more of an old man, but there are times where in a session, if this were to play out and let's just say in this scenario, the guy says, but if his wife says something about parenting, which would make him more accountable, let's say that she says, and, and I know that I've asked for help in bathing the kids now for years to them, which he might say something like, well, you know what uh, Dr. Closi says about men who bend over in cramp circumstances. And this one is based on a true story, honestly, to which then she would say, okay, I looked that up. I can't find where actually Dr. Closi says that to which then he would say, look, I read it. Are you now telling me that my memory is bad? Because let's be serious. Who here has the bad memory? Who forgot to actually wish me a happy birthday at midnight, the day of my birthday, and I had to be the one who said it first. And who forgets to check and see if there's cherry Dr. Pepper Zero in the fridge so that I have one when I get home. So talk about memory. Anyway, now we're arguing about something that is so far off topic and that still remains silly. And this all started with his made up pseudoscience about bending over in bathrooms so that he can get out of giving the kids a bath because he let slip at one point that his dad never had to had to give him a bath. That was his mom's job to which then the wife said flatly, you have zero relationship with your dad now. So is that the goal to which of course he then proceeded to tell her how mean she was to say things like that. But we're still not talking about the increasingly growing elephant in the room is that he's not going to be washing those kids anytime soon. Even though that conversation started with a classic, what can I do to help? Just not that or that or that, but but look, I tried, I asked. And so now he can even throw that back at her. Another person said that he once told me that whenever he formed an opinion, it was because he had thoroughly researched the subject, considered both sides and then made up his mind. Therefore he saw no value in hearing my opinion because it wouldn't sway his decision. So she said, eventually I just stopped voicing disagreements because it seemed futile. But then when I wouldn't voice disagreements or I wouldn't communicate at all, He then would criticize me for not having any opinions, labeling me as a sheep and implying that I wasn't intelligent enough to think for myself. And some of the responses to this post I thought were really interesting. Someone said, this message really strikes a chord with me. My my spouse used the exact same reasoning to dismiss my views, claiming that his opinions are based on extensive research and expertise. And any attempt for me to offer a different perspective was then labeled as fighting. So in his eyes, fighting means simply having an opinion that doesn't align with his. She said he often makes negative and hurtful comments. And if I try to respond in any way to lessen the negativity, now I'm accused as being difficult. So she just has to go along with his opinion and agree with it, or else that means he's fighting. And then if she doesn't agree with it, then that means she has no opinion. Another person said, this all sounds so familiar. My partner would accuse me saying, you always have to fight, uh, fight out of your own corner as if standing up for myself was a negative trait. But she said, I do need to express my opinion when I disagree rather than staying silent. And let me talk about something that happens often in relationships where there's a lot of emotional immaturity in the mix. And it's this whole idea of black and white thinking. It's that mindset where everything is either one way or it's the other. It's right or it's wrong with no in between. If you are not with me, you are against me. And here's the deal with emotionally immature people that they often see the world in this very rigid way. If you come up with a different opinion in their mind, it's not just a different perspective. It's a direct challenge because that does come with this. If you don't agree with me, then you must believe I'm wrong. And that's why I talk so often about curiosity. There's no curiosity there. It just goes straight to defense. That is what that black or white thinking is that all or nothing, but that's not how life works. Having a different opinion is not just okay. It's part of what makes us human. It's part of the whole human experience. And that's how we grow and learn and connect with each other on a much deeper level. Because imagine how dull conversations would be if we all just nodded and agreed on everything. Although what is fascinating is sometimes when I've had a a real live, incredibly emotionally immature, even bordering on narcissistic person in my office, and when they just say things that they feel are the right things to say, I can think of a situation right now where in bringing up this all or nothing, black or white thinking, and in essence, trying to say to the narcissist, but are you just wanting her to agree with everything that you say? Are you not interested in what her opinion is? And he looked at me and said, not really. And then that was his interior landscape of his mind or what it felt like to be him. Because the truth is, and we're talking about from a place of maturity, it is 
totally possible for two opinions to exist in the same space without one canceling out the other. As a matter of fact, that is the way that uh, human interaction is designed to work. It's about sharing and discussing and sometimes agreeing and sometimes disagreeing. And that's okay. doesn't mean that there's a winner and a loser. It means that we are engaging. If we're engaging, it means we're alive and we're kicking and we're just in a big part of this whole rich, complex human experience. That's that's a positive thing. So the next time you bump into that black or white thinking, that all or nothing thinking, remember that the world is actually full of a lot of colors. And it's those colors with their shades and their nuances that really do make life interesting. So the acceptance that we are all having a different experience, but we can have shared experiences is absolutely a sign of maturity. And it can also be a game changer in a relationship. Another person just said, all this is just so, so familiar to me. If I disagreed with him, I was insulting his intelligence. And she said, this is just so messed up. And when I look back on it from a distance and I wanted to address that quickly, it's the concept about rumination, because that's something that already in the sessions that I've done today, before recording this podcast, there's been a theme of people ruminating on the past, beating themselves up for why didn't I know? I can't believe I let this happen. But ruminating on the past interactions, especially those moments in hindsight that really feel messed up, it's absolutely normal to look back and think, man, what was going on there now that you're starting to see this bigger picture. But here's the thing that I can't convey enough. As much as we go over and over those moments in our minds, it doesn't really help us move forward. In fact, it's pretty unproductive because we keep thinking that if we can figure out the past, if we can make sense of the past, then we're going to be able to predict and make sense of the future. And we're still wanting certainty because that will make us feel more calm. But then that wanting certainty can often cause us to try to control more because if I can control people, control my environment, control everything, then I've got my best chance at certainty, but I'm not living the human experience. And I'm certainly not letting other people find out who they are, becoming the best version of themselves. I think about that in a parenting standpoint. If I, hey, I think that this is what my kid needs to do. I think this is the, the subjects they need to study. I think this is the career path that I, I think that they would like. It's a lot of me in there. And if I'm doing it, even if I think it's a, yeah, but I want what's best for them. But really, I want to know that they are going to be okay, which makes sense as a parent. But that's a me thing. I'm taking them out of the decision of what they want to do with their life. And too often, the emotionally immature person then carries that into a marriage or relationship. And they're doing that same thing as well of, hey, this other person is basically here to do things for me, make me feel better. So then I'm going to control them because for some reason, I think that I know what's best for them, which is a sign of emotional immaturity. Back to the rumination, because the things that happened, they happened. Those interactions happened. Back then, you did not know what you didn't know. So it's like you're trying to now solve a puzzle, but you don't have all those pieces. And now you're starting to find those missing pieces, and the picture is starting to become a little more clear. But the goal isn't to try to put that puzzle together, but it's just recognizing that I didn't have all the pieces. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be more curious and open moving forward. Because it's huge to then recognize now, to be aware of what happened, but then it, the, the growth occurs when you can accept that happened. And now what do I do moving forward? How can that teach me? How can that inform and instruct me on how I show up in life moving forward? So if you catch yourself ruminating or beating yourself up about the past, I would love to just encourage a pause. Pause for a moment and just give yourself grace and compassion. And remember, you did not have the full picture back then. But now you're gathering more of those pieces, you're understanding more, and now you're making changes about what you can do moving forward. That really is what counts. So do me a favor. Don't be too hard on yourself for not having all the answers from the get-go. This is part of that journey, recognizing where we've been, where we're heading. That is a huge step in the right direction. You're, You're doing just fine. More death by a thousand cut stories. Another person said, last summer I underwent surgery for melanoma. When I first found out about my diagnosis and shared the news with my partner, his immediate response was, okay, I'm actually the one who's probably going to get skin cancer with all the work that I do outside. And she said it was astonishing how he managed to shift the focus immediately to himself right after I just told him about my own skin cancer diagnosis. She said, thankfully, the surgery was successful and her follow-up appointments have been positive. But then just yesterday, the day before she posted this, she said, I excitedly told him that my latest appointment went well and everything looks good. And his reaction was, okay. I've had people talk about similar things where they've gotten a thumbs up when they found out that they're cancer free from a text. She said, it's become painfully clear that he shows no genuine concern for my health or my well-being, despite almost three decades together. She said, I still find myself hoping for a different response, but it's disheartening every time he shows me how little that I seem to matter to him. 
But this one is, this one's really interesting. She said, every time we had a major argument, he would end up driving himself to the ER in the early hours of the morning. She said, I'd receive a text from him upon his arrival, explaining that he went alone because he didn't want to wake me up, but he was going through something. His messages were vague, only offering small bits of information. When I inquired about his condition, he mentioned things like the doctors being uncertain and ordering more x-rays and more blood tests, or even trying to consider, should they admit him? Should they not? And she's like, this would obviously leave me anxious and I would be on edge and sure of the severity of his situation. Hours later though, he would text again and he would say, Hey, can you come give me a ride home? Because in his words, the doctors were incompetent. So she said, I would go pick him up. Usually he'd start feeling better a few hours after we got home. Then he'd ask me, can you drive me back to the hospital? Cause I got to get my car knowing that I have back issues and that long drives are painful for me. He didn't seem to care or put or factor that into the equation. The round trip to the hospital was 30 to 40 minutes, meaning four trips in one day was physically taxing. She said those ER visits became a monthly occurrence for quite a while and they become less frequent now, usually only happening when he's extremely upset with me, particularly if he doesn't get the reaction or even the argument that he's seeking. And she said, additionally, it became clear that these weren't true emergencies as he would often feel significantly better just hours after being brought home to the point of now he could go out for the evening. So from ER to going out for the evening and those doggone incompetent doctors. So that is, what's the phrase? Uh, something that really grinds my gears and it is perfectly illustrated by that last story. And it is this baffling and kind of insulting assumption that the narcissist or the incredibly emotionally immature person seems to make that we're, we're all just a bunch of gullible folks who buy into any story, no matter how far-fetched it is. So then imagining that scenario, somebody dashes into the ER after a few hours uh, of the medical team supposedly just all scratching their heads in utter bewilderment. This person just throws up their hands and says, oh, forget it. This isn't worth my time. Texts his wife, come pick me up. As then the modern hospital would then with all of its expertise, protocols, would then just let a patient dictate the pace and what to do and then just wander off because they're a little bit miffed because these doggone doctors don't know what they're doing. And it goes back to that concept where the emotionally mature, the narcissist truly believe that they are the special one whose mysterious condition has left the entire medical community in a daze. It's like, really? So these doctors, trained professionals who have seen it all would be completely stumped and just let somebody walk out in a huff. Uh, that's kind of silly. And it's, it's not just frustrating, but again, it's more of this insult to your intelligence. And I hear these stories often about what people say that they know about therapy that have not been to therapy. I have been a practicing therapist for 17, 18 years every day, not weekends. I'm saying that because now the, I can see the emotionally mature. Oh, really? Every day, seven days a week. Is that what you're trying to say? Which is not the point. But when somebody has not been to therapy, but they want to explain to me what they think therapy is like, then that is, it is adorable. Or I hear people to say that therapist or that counselor, they've got their own agenda says the person who has no idea what, what my practice is about, or hasn't even been to therapy or especially to see me because that's, that is how special that person is that they know more about the attorney. They know more about the doctor. They know more about the therapist than even the therapist does. And I don't even have to go to therapy to know that. So that is that sign of emotional immaturity, but it's, it's interesting though, because it just shows you the links that people go to. And a lot of it's subconscious to then put themselves in the center of every narrative. I know. I know, and you don't understand, and they got an agenda and you can't go see this one. I mentioned this on a podcast a week or so ago on the virtual couch, but it's this concept around having now seen close to 1500 couples where a new couples therapist, because I was this at one point will then sometimes question maybe one of my, my clients, if they're interacting with them as an individual saying, well, wait, he can't see you know, the couple and then still talk to you guys individually that graduate school said you can't do that. But then there's enough of us couples therapists that have been doing this for a long time that recognize, okay, that's what I, I know how to do. And I'm very comfortable in doing that. And so then if somebody's trying to tell me you can't do that, it might be a good idea to, to start with some curiosity and ask, what's that experience like? Do you ever uh, find that that's difficult or what is difficult about it? Or at what point and how many couples and how many years doing this, did you finally feel like that was something that you, you could do and still maintain the the integrity of the therapeutic alliance versus the well i don't think that they should be able to do that again putting yourself at the center of every narrative and then expecting somebody else to follow along without question we're moving to arizona i had someone uh, maybe a couple of weeks ago spend quite a bit of time 
reminding me how hot it is in Arizona as if I had never thought about that. And I thought it was really interesting because they just said, okay, as long as you know, <laughs> so I, I do. And uh, they continued on that narrative as if then now I was supposed to, I think during that session, call off the entire move and try to purchase my house back and sell the house that we had bought, let the entire family know that's moved because this person's like, okay, I'm just saying it's pretty hot. So that person had inserted themselves in the center of that narrative, and, and it's adorable. It really is. Here's another another story. Recently, we found out that my husband's mother had to go to the hospital due to some flu-like symptoms, especially concerning because of her history with stroke. And I naturally started asking more questions to try to understand the situation better. Hey, what was wrong with your mom? But my husband just went and sat on the couch and started playing on his phone, ignoring my attempts to engage. I sat next to him in silence, trying to just think of helpful suggestions, such as ways to maybe we could get more information, since... Apparently his dad didn't have any updates. And she said, I suggested a couple of things. The next day though, he criticized me for being cold and not offering him a hug despite my efforts to support him. And she said, feel free to use this story on your podcast. Also, there was an incident that somebody shared last year where we were walking in the neighborhood with a friend car passed by and my husband claimed that somebody in the car threw a rock at him. So he reacted by yelling at the vehicle, but the car didn't even stop or react in any noticeable way as it drove by. She said, my friend and I were puzzled because we hadn't seen anybody throw anything. And when I asked my husband to clarify, his story started to fall apart. I wasn't really sure if it was actually a rock. And she said, I suggested that maybe a car just kicked up a pebble or something. But he insisted, no, that was impossible according to his understanding of the laws of physics. However, she then found herself literally looking up the laws of physics and found that it was possible that the car tire could kick up a rock. But despite this, then her questioning turned her into the enemy in his eyes. And he ended up more upset with her than the supposed rock throwing incident, which nobody else witnessed. And the car showed no signs of aggression or acknowledgement. And she said this issue years later still comes up and causes tension between us that he never supported her during the time where those hooligans chucked those giant boulders from the, the passing by car. Another person said during the love bombing phase, he constantly complimented my appearance, never missing a chance to comment on my beauty. However, that eventually ceased. And she said, sometimes seeking reassurance, I would ask, do you still think I'm pretty or are you still attracted to me? And rather than offering reassurance, his responses were eye rolls or dismissive comments like, well, if you don't know, then I think that's on you. And she said, for me, the most significant pain points have been the unfulfilled promises that he's left all responsibilities and burdens to me, offering no assistance with the kids, household chores, financial support. She said, it's watching me struggle without offering any help. Since somebody else said, oh my gosh, I experienced that too. And then he would also say, you would be so much more attractive if you'd fill in the blank, which he said, usually lose weight. Another person responded and said, totally agree with leaving all the burdens and responsibility of the house. I couldn't ask him to help because he didn't like authority. So he would fight against it. I couldn't expect him to do anything without being asked because how was he supposed to know that things needed to be done? But then if I did it myself, then I was being passive aggressive by doing it around him. So I ended up doing a lot of the housework when he wasn't around. So he wouldn't feel bad that he was sitting on the sofa while he did it, which then prompted him to say, I didn't do anything because he never saw it. Uh, another person said, absolutely, or making me feel guilty for doing housework instead of sitting around like him. He would get mad because then I'm not spending time with him. If I'm upset, the house is a mess, then that's on me because he's not expecting it. So darned if you do, darned if you don't. Another person, yes, in all capital letters. And if he ever had anything to do, mow the lawn, for example, he complained that he was never home and he just wanted to relax and be with the kids. And it wasn't fair of me to ask him to spend time away from them on his one day off. Sympathy grab. I just, I put a little note in there when I was reading through these moms never have the day off. And then someone responded and said, were we married to the same man? And my first thought was this week on the Jerry Springer show. Yes. In fact, they were. And let's talk about something that's both, it's sad and Honestly, it's all too common in relationships where, again, there's emotional immaturity or where there are more of these narcissistic traits and tendencies. And it's, it's about these moments then when somebody shares something deeply, it can be really personal, something that makes you feel vulnerable, like when you're worried your partner might not find you attractive anymore. And I am the very first person to say that oh, that sounded narcissistic. I am one who very much believes that self-love is crucial. And that we need to find that acceptance and love within ourselves. And, and as somebody that has been on that journey of becoming, uh, moving toward more emotional maturity from emotional immaturity, it, it, we definitely don't know what we don't know when you still don't feel comfortable in your own skin. And when you get closer to that place, then it is easier for somebody to, to 
tell you what they think you're supposed to do and you can sit with that discomfort, be a little more curious because ultimately it's a you thing in a good way. But there, there are times if we're being real where we are looking for that little bit of reassurance from our partner. You know, it, it is like we're sending out these emotional bids asking, do you see me? Do you love me? Do you have my back? Can I count on you? And it's in those moments, then that's where it feels like you are handing somebody your heart. But what happens then when instead of cherishing it or being grateful for that gift of somebody sharing their vulnerability or feelings or emotions with you, if they take it and then they scrunch it up and they throw it on the ground and they stomp on it, you know, when they use your vulnerability against you to control or manipulate, it, it's heartbreaking. And over time, this leads to a place where you just stop sharing your feelings with your spouse or the person that is in this emotionally manipulative or coercive situation. Why? Because there's a good chance those feelings won't be validated or even acknowledged. You might be nothing or they'll be weaponized against you. And then those insecurities that you opened up about, that you finally felt like I can share with somebody when you're, you're seeking reassurance from the one person who's supposed to have your back, when then that person then throws this vulnerability back in your face as a tool of manipulation or control. I mean, that's a tough spot to be in because you start to realize that the very things that you shared in confidence, hoping for support can and will be used against you. And it becomes this reminder of the importance of feeling emotionally safe in relationships because without it, we find ourselves holding back. We're protecting our hearts from the very person who should be helping us guard it. Let me get back to the stories. My daughter visited my house with a message from my ex about the dog, mentioning how much he missed the dog. At first glance, it might have seemed like a trivial comment, but she said, I'm thankful for the support of others in the group who understood the impact that it had on her. She said, it felt like a subtle jab at me, implying I missed the dog, but not you, and portrayed him as the victim to my daughter, suggesting, poor me, your mom took the dog away. She said, this situation stirred up feelings of guilt towards him and frustration and sadness for her daughter. She said her daughter then was unfairly placed in the middle. And she said it also felt like an intrusion into the new space that she's been trying to create for herself to move on and heal. Let me just address that for a second too. I think what is really difficult is people get into these situations of where there's going to be a, a divorce and they say, okay, we just want to do what's best for the kids. And, and I, I will say then, I think so often in that moment, the people do mean it feels like the right thing to say in that moment. And that is what they want to do. But then you get out of that moment and now the first time that maybe one of the kids is complaining about having to go between houses and then the more emotionally immature person says, well, I don't, I wish it wasn't happening either. That's uh, it's your, your dad wanted the divorce. And I think that can be a really difficult thing to put the kid in the middle. And when people will say, well, I'm just being honest. Okay. But that's a you issue of being able to sit with that discomfort of wanting to express your frustration and anger do that to a therapist or to maybe an adult friend, but to your kid, what a chance for you to say, man, I know that that sounds hard, but I really appreciate the way you're showing up. And uh, hey, what can we do? What can we do today? Because um, I'm just grateful to have this time with you. There, that is a big difference than, yeah, I know I hate it too, champ. I wish we didn't have to do this, but you know, what are we supposed to do? Your mom doesn't want me back in the house because that kid, that is putting that burden over on the kid. This is a you thing and, and an opportunity for you to learn how to recognize your own frustration and, and then show up for your kid and show them that, hey, we care about you and we love you regardless. Small tangent there. All right, back to the stories. Another person said, my ex-husband allowed our friends and his family to harass and bully me without intervening, even when I was visibly upset and in tears. Instead of supporting me, he would get angry, accusing me of embarrassing him. And she, he said that I was seeking attention. He insisted it was my duty to defend myself and viewed my inability to do so as a sign of weakness, claiming that then he lost respect for me. His family is dominant, they're argumentative, and because of that, it leaves her feeling powerless. And any attempt to express her feelings, or when she couldn't and felt like she wanted to cry during the ride home, was met with his cold derision. He would calmly demean me, call me ridiculous, pathetic, childish, and he would threaten divorce for my reactions. And then his calm and collected demeanor made it difficult for me to recognize the abuse for what it was that she's allowed to have her feelings. And, and I appreciate when she's even saying that, that, that concept of uh, if his family is argumentative and I think in his position, there's a chance for him to, to defend her because if that is not who she is by nature, then who is he to then demand that or expect that of her? And 
this stuff tugs at my heartstrings, sounding dramatic, because it brings us back to that fundamental reason why we often feel like we can't freely express our emotions. Again, our emotions are there for a very crucial reason. They help us understand ourselves better because from a young age, even the most well-intentioned parents aim to teach their kids the difference between right and wrong, but we're kids and we're just being kids and exploring the world in our very unique, messy, loud ways. And if the kid is frequently met with corrections and critiques, which again, even I know I did a lot of that is when my, when my kids were little, because we do, we, we really want to protect our kids. We want to try to teach them these meaningful lessons. But so often we do that at the expense of being able to just be there for them, provide that secure attachment and not this feeling that they are not doing it right when it is life or that they, there's this conditional love that's attached that if they don't do it the way that I want them to, then I will not be happy or I will not give them validation. So we, we so often meet our kids with the, you know, Hey, we don't say that. Or why did you do that? Or use a softer voice or speak up. I can't hear you. And it doesn't matter how you do it. Just as long as you do it, except for why did you do it that way? And what were you thinking? And you should have known better. So over time, that constant feedback starts to lead a kid to believe that simply being themselves is not acceptable and their emotions, if they express them apparently are wrong. So they start to internalize those emotions. They become more reactive, feeling like they need somebody else to validate their actions or tell them that it's okay to feel a certain way. And that's a tough cycle where just being yourself starts to feel like somehow it's wrong. And this is why it's so important for us to understand and validate our emotions, uh, recognize them as a natural and very essential part of who we are because they ultimately guide us through this, the journey of life, of self-discovery, of growth. Okay, back to the stories. Another woman said, there are so many instances that come to mind. For example, during disagreements, my husband often threatens to skip upcoming social events. This has been his tactic for years, but he recently confessed that he does this to punish me, hoping I'll feel the absence of his, and she put in quotation marks, support. Additionally, he's begun neglecting his duties as a parent during these times, refusing to take our younger kids to sports, practices, birthday parties, and other activities that our child was looking forward to, to punish me. She said, though, However, one of the most distressing incidents occurred during a family camping trip about six hours from home. Amid a minor disagreement where he was trying to control me and I resisted, he threatened to leave us at the beach near our campground and he was going to hitchhike home. She said this was particularly alarming given uh, our heightened concerns about COVID at the time, which had led him to impose strict public safety measures on our family, including wiping down our groceries. So moreover, he was aware of these crucial details about our new camper that I wasn't making his threat even more concerning. And he made this threat in front of our then toddler. She said, I chose not to intervene, pretending to leave. He then actually ended up hiding behind a bush near the, the truck. She said a couple hours later, as her son and, and her were returning to the truck, he emerged and he was so frustrated that I hadn't sought him out or attempted to stop him on the road. Next, someone said, my husband openly acknowledges his hypochondria and frequently experiences both genuine and explicable illnesses. This often leads him to withdraw from responsibilities at our shared workplace and at home, opting to rest in the afternoon or retire early, even before our son's bedtime. Despite this, he prioritizes his workouts as part of his self-care routine. However, when I don't feel well, he still expects me to prepare meals for the family, handle the cleanup. She said, I've recently set boundaries around this behavior, but he attempts to make me feel so guilty for doing so. She said, he also makes me feel guilty if I want to prepare a meal for friends who are either seriously ill or have just had a baby, arguing that it's not in our budget, even though we most definitely can afford it, or that it detracts from family time. I think this is an interesting one, as simple as that sounds, but is it because we can't afford it or is it because it detracts from family time? And I often feel like those are those subtle instances where the emotionally immature is just trying to find the right button to push that will get the person to react so that then he can jump back into that uh, position of control. Another person said that her husband's an enthusiastic garage sale shopper and has found many valuable items for her home and family, which we might not have been able to afford otherwise. So she's starting out with a positive. She says, I'm grateful for his efforts and I try to show my appreciation. But if I express a desire for something new, like a sweater, she said, considering I literally haven't bought one in over a decade, he accuses me of being ungrateful for the clothes that he has found for me suggesting that he's already provided everything that I could possibly need. There's no curiosity or questions there. Another person said, after the holidays, my husband approached me expressing concerns about our budget being tight. He requested that I jot down every anticipated expense for the upcoming month. 
when I sought clarification, asking if this included the basic household items like soap, which she said fell under her purview. And no, I did not have to look that up. Okay, yes, maybe I did. And that does mean under her scope of influence. Then he confirmed that, yeah, that did. And she said, I found this request unreasonable given our financial situation isn't dire. We've had numerous discussions confirming this. So she said, I suggested that his request seemed more rooted in trust issues and then asked him to elaborate. Tell me more. He then quickly changed his stance, claiming he thought that I was referring to, oh, the fancy soap, something that she says we've actually never purchased in the 13 years that we've been together. The very next day, he dedicated the morning and early afternoon to organizing a very expensive vacation with his extended family. He not only researched and booked an Airbnb, but also insisted on a $2,500 deposit, a larger sum than any other family member, including his financially stable parents, what they had committed to. So this move, she said, was perplexing, especially following our recent conversation about budgeting down to the cost of soap. When I questioned the discrepancy between his budgeting concerns and his eagerness to book an expensive vacation, then he staunchly defended his actions. She said this situation felt more like emotional whiplash than the gradual erosion of death by a thousand cuts, but it's all part of the same troubling pattern. Feel free to share the story as you see fit. Another person said, my husband often complained about me going to bed earlier than him, feeling left alone at night. Last summer, she said I was dealing with severe nerve pain that made it impossible for me to sleep. I would leave the bedroom to sit with my heat pack for some relief. One night, and this one gets really interesting. She said one night, because she left the bedroom and then came out to where he was, he mentioned that my being there disrupted his time spent looking at porn. She said he moved out at the end of that summer, coincidentally the day before I started a new job, leaving me emotionally distraught on my first day. Now she asked a, a, a very good follow-up. She, she said, by the way, Tony, I'd appreciate any insights you might have on how porn plays a role in emotionally immature relationships. She said, it seemed like my husband used it as a way to avoid working on our connection. He would then make me feel guilty for his porn usage, blaming it on my not fulfilling his sexual desires, which only made me feel unsafe about being intimate with him. And additionally, he carried a lot of shame feeling rejected when I said no to certain things, or if I expressed needing time to feel comfortable with something said this might be an interesting topic for a podcast and it really would and it's something that i haven't taken on and i know i've got the waking up the narcissism podcast the virtual couch and it's interesting because i know that a lot of people that i interact with know me for whatever that is that we're talking about whether it's adhd navigating a faith crisis which i, I love helping people talk about that we've got the couples therapy model we got the four pillars or we're talking about acceptance and commitment therapy but I also have a book called He's a Porn Addict, Now What? An Expert and a Former Addict to Answer Your Questions, which spent a couple of years on the sexual health and recovery bestseller list. And and I have a online pornography recovery program called The Path Back, which is it's an amazing program. I'm very feel very good about that. Helped a lot of people with that. And so I do identify that porn is a, it's a coping mechanism that typically people turn to when they feel, I, I always say a lack of connection in one of five areas, when they don't feel connected in their marriage, when they don't feel connected as a parent, when they're struggling with their faith, their health, or their work. And when those things happen, they turn to unhealthy coping mechanisms, things like porn or work, alcohol, drugs, their phone. It can be a lot of different things to cope. And so then when I'm trying to help people then uh, become better in these areas, those five voided areas, then they turn to those unhealthy coping mechanisms less. So when you look at the concepts around emotional immaturity, there is a lot of impulsivity, maybe somebody that just doesn't like to sit with any discomfort, they're gonna get rid of that discomfort by turning to a coping mechanism. So a lot of times let's, I think it's safe to say that in these situations, the, the guy is not feeling connected in his relationship or his marriage. And how does he get rid of his discomfort? He pushes it off to his wife because he's not willing to sit with that discomfort or take ownership. And then what's the way to get rid of his discomfort is then turning to porn, but then not wanting to be able to sit with the fact that he, he turns to pornography and, and objectifies uh, women or the concept of where it can warp somebody's sexuality. And I'm just given such a broad overview. And I think this would be a great topic for a podcast in, in the future. But then in that scenario, then, then it, here comes that, that confabulation that I have to change the narrative because it can't be that I'm wanting to look at porn. It's because you aren't being intimate enough. We're not having enough sex. So again, he can't sit with that, take ownership of that. It is uncomfortable. Turn to a health, unhealthy coping mechanism, then confabulate the narrative that I kid, this isn't who I am. It's because of you. So I think there's a lot to be said there that we could talk about in a future episode. 
And another person then said on the same thread, she said, yeah, I've had similar, a similar experience receiving complaints about not being intimate enough. But when I attempted to initiate intimacy, I was rejected because he had already, and she put in quotes, sorted himself out with porn earlier. She said he blamed me for this of why he had to turn to porn, yet he never made any effort to initiate intimacy himself. Another person said that she had mentioned that it would be nice to set a romantic mood, perhaps light a candle, play some music. But even these small gestures were seen as too demanding, which is very interesting. She said, honestly, it felt like he preferred to be left alone with his alcohol, his porn, and his PlayStation. He couldn't admit, by the way, that has to be in a country song lyric. But he couldn't admit his this preference, possibly due to deep-seated shame. So instead, he blamed me for his reliance on those things. Again, he doesn't want to take ownership of that, sit with that discomfort. So it has to be her fault. And there's a person in the group that I just, she does such an amazing job responding and it's just solid. She, here's what she said about it. And and I think she's so spot on. And again, we'll still cover this in an upcoming episode, but she said many individuals who frequently use porn started at a young age during a critical period when their brains were developing capacities for empathy, compassion, and understanding others. Instead, their minds were inundated with content that objectifies and reduces human interaction to mere consumption of bodies. This can significantly hinder their emotional and psychological growth. She said, it's important to recognize that you can't be held accountable for behaviors and patterns that were established long before you came into their lives. Such habits can condition their brains to view women as objects for their entitlement and use. And this skewed perspective distorts their understanding of reality and relationships, leading them to conflate sex with love. They fail to grasp the essence of true intimacy and connection because they've never learned to value another person in deep, meaningful and respectful ways. So for somebody emotionally immature, porn is appealing because it's always accessible, demands nothing from them, and doesn't challenge their behavior. So well said. Another person responded, this is now a a separate uh, topic, separate thread. She said, when my therapist highlighted that a significant issue in our relationship was my husband's failure to celebrate my achievements, I brought it up after a marriage counseling session. His His response was, well, what is there to celebrate or be proud of? And she said that left her so disheartened. For instance, she said he belittled my accomplishment of graduating with an associate's degree, mocking it because it was from a community college. Similarly, he dismissed the significance of me giving birth to our children, stating you couldn't help giving birth and you didn't do a particularly amazing job anyway, which sorry for the mothers who heard that just now, because I think if guys had to have babies, probably wouldn't be around. I don't I can't imagine doing that. Uh, He trivialized births as routine and suggested I needed his help rather than acknowledgement or pride. That's just wild. Another person said, despite both of us being raised Catholic and marrying in the church, he reneged on his promise to support raising our children in the faith after losing his own. This betrayal was particularly painful after we moved across the country for his career, a move I agreed to partly because he vowed to assist with taking the kids to mass, recognizing I couldn't manage it alone. Yet when I sought his help, he criticized me, saying, It's really messed up that the religious person needs the atheist to get her to church. Now, ironically, he now opposes divorce on the grounds of our Catholic faith, treating marriage as a sacrament despite his earlier actions. And I think that's, I would imagine, because that's how the button that he can push that didn't get her to then stay in the position, that one down position, so he has that control. Another person said, his insensitivity is extended to my feelings about my body, especially in relation to his viewing of pornography. When I expressed insecurity, comparing myself to the unrealistic standards set by such content, he insensitively suggested that there's a niche for everyone. And I don't even want to give this the airtime, but he said, including grandmother things, despite me being only 35. What an insult. She says that, and this is her pathological kindness, I would imagine, because she says, although he might have intended to reassure me, his comment lingers in my mind, especially when I see my stretch marks. She said it feels shallow to dwell on this, considering these marks are a testament to carrying, birthing, and nurturing three beautiful children, a sacrifice I would willingly make again. Yet it's painful that their father never appreciated any of these sacrifices. She said, I'm sharing this uh, as is, feeling okay about it. And I'm grateful that she felt confident enough to share that because that's not okay to say that and expect that, that to have your partner feel safe and opening up about anything. Another person said, you're welcome to use any of these examples as they are. Some might seem trivial, but they were significant in my experience. He frequently accused me of being mentally and emotionally unstable, especially if he disapproved of something I did or said. He often claimed I was upset when I wasn't, using it as a pretext to be angry with me. He criticized me for not being sufficiently grateful or for not expressing thanks properly, not just to him, but also to his family and even to kind strangers, labeling me as arrogant and entitled. He was overly concerned about my posture, constantly telling me to 
pull my shoulders back and sometimes physically adjusting them himself. While shopping, he accused me of being reckless with the shopping cart and obstructing other people's paths. He complained that my voice was piercing and hurt his ears, leading me to adjust my volume, only for him to then say he couldn't hear me. Speak up. She said this has left me feeling anxious about speaking up in any setting. He ridiculed the way I sit while driving. Whenever we dined out, it had to be his idea. If I suggested a place, he would either give me the silent treatment all night or criticize my behavior throughout our outing. However, she said this never happened when we went to a place that he chose. Eventually, I stopped making suggestions, but then he would complain that I showed no interest in our outings. I just feel like if you need to, hit the back button a couple of times on your podcast player and listen to that list one more time and then just have that reality check in with yourself. Because remember, our partner, our child, our friend, they are their own person brimming with emotion and experiences and light and life and talents and abilities. But all too often, those who are emotionally immature or who display these narcissistic traits and tendencies seem to have, it's it's called an antagonistic relationship with those people around them. And while I am usually not one to deep dive into scientific concepts, the situation is something from biology called antagonism. And it's this idea where one organism benefits at the expense of another. So in the context of relationships, it's like the emotionally immature or narcissistic individual thrives while diminishing the other person, which is just something worth reflecting on. That if one person can only feel better about themselves when they take down another person, then that is an incredibly unhealthy relationship. So if that resonates with you even slightly, then I, I would highly recommend that you reach out to somebody to get some help because that itself comes from your own childhood wounding of feeling like you have to control somebody into loving you, but you can't do that. You can have love or control in an adult relationship, period, not both. So with that said, I like when I can take a minute and talk about what a healthy, mature relationship looks like especially in contrast to those, the dynamics that, that I just laid out there, that antagonistic attachment style. It's uh, in essence, picture two people securely attached, navigating life side by side. They are in it together. They're aiming for common goals. They offer and receive empathy and it's second nature. They don't have to question what does that person mean by this? And if they do, they can ask. And they are two completely interdependent, unique individuals that, of course, have different thoughts, different feelings, different emotions. And that's what is so uh, attractive about the other person is that I want to get to know them and they want to get to know me. It's not that I want to control them. It's then being able to share the real, the, the true and the heartfelt version of you. And that starts to lay down this solid foundation of trust and intimacy with every word, with every gesture and everything becomes an opportunity for you to self confront and grow and for you to find out more about what your partner's experience is and in, in efforts to have, again, these, these amazing shared experiences or to make you a better person. And yes, you will bump heads from time to time disagreements. Sure. They're, they're part of the package, but here's the kicker, the mutual support, that part solid, the respect and love that you have for each other. It's not negotiable. Those are not things that are up for debate or they're not threatened by the rough patches. So this is what a cooperative approach to a relationship looks like. You're working as a team where empathy and, and all kind of truth, uh, uh, vulnerability, affection, those are the building blocks of something that is genuinely profound and therefore lasts. There's no control, no manipulation, none. What I thought would be interesting to do is flip the script and then talk about what then one as an adult human being in a healthy, non-controlling relationship can be and do what they're absolutely entitled to do because remembering that your feelings, your actions, your decisions are absolutely valid. So I'm going to go back to that list. This is why I suggested maybe backing up and listen to that list again. Let me go through that list now of if this person is in a healthy relationship, you have the right to experience and express your emotions without being labeled as unstable. Your feelings are valid regardless of whether someone else approves or understands them. You're allowed to feel calm and not upset. And you don't need to justify your emotional state to anybody. And if you're not upset, you're not upset, period. Expressing gratitude is beautiful, but you're not obligated to perform uh, appreciation in a specific way to meet somebody else's expectation or to make them give you that approval. Your gratitude, when you choose to express it, is enough. Your posture is yours to manage. You're the only one who gets to decide how you stand or sit or walk. 
If you're comfortable, it's all that matters. And if you're not, then, then get some help. Shopping carts and how you navigate them, turns out that's your business. Moving through a store is it's about your comfort and convenience. It's about if you want to choose the one with the wobbly wheel, you go for it. It's not about adhering to somebody else's standards of cart etiquette. And your voice, literally your voice, is uniquely yours. Whether it is loud or soft or somewhere in between, you don't need to modulate it to suit somebody else's preferences. Speak in the way that feels right to you. The way you sit while driving should be about your comfort and safety, not about meeting somebody else's aesthetic standards. Suggesting places to eat, activities to do, or anything that involves decision-making in a relationship turns out it's a two-way street, and you should feel uh, free to make suggestions without fear of the silent treatment or criticism, because it turns out your ideas and preferences matter just as much as your partner's. So in a healthy relationship, you're encouraged to be yourself, to express your needs, make decisions together. It's about mutual respect and support and understanding where both partners feel valued and they both feel heard. Another person said that they're okay with me sharing everything. The episode on death by a thousand cuts, she said was a turning point for her. And it was when she realized that she had found the help that she needed. She said, can we talk about financial thousand cuts? She said, when seeking advice, I often encountered non-committal responses with others likening their experiences to mine or advising patients or emphasizing the importance of supporting my husband through job difficulties. So she said, because of that, she said, I avoided discussing financial issues. I never initiated conversations about budgeting after enduring gaslighting and playing the victim. He'd agree to a budget, but then never last more than a month. I did an episode a while ago on shelf life. He lied about his lunch expenses. He hid fast food receipts and trash. He played the victim when I expressed frustration over his lack of full work days or concern for our financial struggles. He refused to seek financial advice or assistance. Job hopping was frequent, blaming the economy, bosses, or others. He ensured funds were available for his sports viewing. He failed to acknowledge the effort and humiliation involved in applying for financial assistance programs. She said my birthday was typically ignored during his unemployment. He adopted a victim stance when I sought help from church leaders. Financial discussions were redirected to how they impacted him with complaints about how budgeting highlighted his earnings and made him feel bad. His mother employed him for basement work, which she, she calls it, rewarding him with clothes, gadgets while our family struggled. And he blamed me for being dissatisfied with his income, painting me as greedy in counseling sessions. She said, if I prepared leftovers for dinner, then he would make himself a different meal. She said, these financial challenges were just another layer of the complex difficulties that we faced, underscoring the emotional and practical struggles within our relationship. And another person addressed the financial control as well. She said, throughout our marriage as a stay-at-home mom, I had no control over her finances, which were entirely managed by my husband, including investments. When he sold the property and considered reinvesting the proceeds, I suggested buying a small vacation home for our children to enjoy during the summer, which could also be rented out. However, after viewing a few properties, he dismissed the, the idea, claiming it wouldn't be profitable, and instead invested in the stock market, where he unfortunately lost a significant portion of the money. She said, I was responsible for purchasing groceries, children's clothing, school pictures, and even furniture, but I could only use one specific credit card and I was on a strict budget. The monthly bill paying session was a dreaded event. Any overspending, whether by 50 or $500, resulted in hours of beratement. He blamed me for potential future failures, such as the kids not attending college or the inability to go on a vacation, questioning how I managed before we were married. My allowance, she called it, was $300 biweekly from which any overspending was deducted as my punishment. This situation was so distressing that I would pretend to sleep to avoid confrontation, feeling utterly incapable and fearful of independence. Despite living in a $3 million inherited home rent-free, the financial scrutiny over minor amounts was baffling. As I leave this marriage, I'm resigned to receiving nothing from the home where I raised our children, a place that actually never truly felt like mine. She said on one occasion while chatting with a neighbor, I decided to bring in the garbage bins. Typically my husband's task is a kind gesture. Upon his return, instead of expressing gratitude, he criticized the placement of the bins, particularly the compost bin, which he claimed made his task more difficult. When I addressed his comment, he accused me of overreacting, asserting his right to dictate household operations because we were married. Another person said, you are welcome to share any of these experiences. They might seem minor to some, but then again, were profoundly impactful for me. She said, gifts became a source of disappointment rather than joy. The first Christmas after we were married, he gave me pots and pans, and for my birthday, a vacuum cleaner. When my daughters excitedly chose a portable record player for his vast but unused record collection, his reaction was dismissive and critical, leaving them and me heartbroken. 
My gifts remain predictably uninspired, highlighting a lack of thoughtfulness and attention. His behavior in public, like overly staging affectionate reunions with our daughter to garner attention, felt disingenuous and focused more on appearances than genuine connection. The daily interrogations about my activities and conversations left me walking on eggshells, creating a constant state of anxiety and humiliation. Rigid dinner routines and unrealistic expectations around household chores like bringing in the garbage bins were enforced under his critical eye, often leading to unnecessary conflict and criticism. Comparisons to his late mother set an impossible standard, making me feel inadequate and undervalued, a sentiment that extended to his father's comparisons as well. She said her volunteer work, particularly her involvement with the Red Cross at Ground Zero, became a source of shame rather than pride under his scrutiny, leading me to hide this significant part of my life even from our children. She said that had been a huge part of her life. Eventually, I couldn't mention any of my experience around Ground Zero. She said I put my hard hat and vest in a box in the garage and never mentioned it again. He made me ashamed of something I was once proud of. My kids didn't know about it until they were teenagers. They were shocked and couldn't believe I had kept that from them. They learned all about it in school and were very proud of me. His insecurities seemed to make them feel that my achievements somehow made him look less than, so he belittled me until I broke. Counseling, sought as a means of healing, turned into another battleground with his insistence on a male counselor and eventual dismissal of the process reflecting on his unwillingness to address our issues constructively. His accusations of a guilty conscience and dismissive apologies after exhaustive arguments left me feeling empty and questioning my own sanity, contributing to a decline in my mental well-being and my memory. The constant invasion of privacy and lack of respect for personal boundaries exacerbated feelings of anxiety and panic profoundly affecting my sense of safety and comfort in my own home. So she said these experiences, while individually they might seem small, they collectively represent a profound impact on my well-being and my self-perception, underscoring the deep and lasting effects of living in a controlling and an unsupportive relationship. Okay, I think I've got plenty more that we'll just save for the eighth installment of Death by a Thousand Cuts, but thanks for taking the time today. And hopefully you can see that through all of these stories and reflections that there there is a bit of a silver lining that keeps shining through. And it's about realizing that, yeah, these people have faced these challenges that most would, it would probably knock most people off their feet. But then here are these people sharing these experiences, whether it's in a group, sending me the emails. And as they're starting to put these pieces together, they are recognizing that they are surviving. And they're starting to get stronger. And yeah, it's a bit of a slow process, but you are you really are right where you need to be. And you're doing as much as you can right now. And with that acceptance and hearing and taking in this information, it is starting to change the interior landscape of your mind or what it feels like to be you. And and it's just a reminder that, uh, you know, we're not, it's, we're not just surviving these experiences. You're learning from them too. And you're starting to gather up a lot of wisdom and not just to even heal yourself, but you can also start lighting the way for others on this path too. Let me give a couple of action steps that uh, I think are, are key. One of those is spend a little bit of time journaling, honestly, or self-reflection, whether it's daily or weekly, it doesn't have to be in a narrative format, but I really feel like it's important to write down some of these experiences because your, your short-term memory is probably, it's on life support right now because your whole brain is focused on trying to make sense of the nonsense. And part of that complex post-traumatic stress disorder is that eventually your brain is sending all its blood flow to the amygdala to then get ready for battle. And one of the areas that it robs is the short-term memory, the hippocampus. So it is important to write things down. I used to feel like that maybe isn't as productive to write down all of the negative things that have happened. But when you start questioning your own sanity and thinking that things maybe aren't so bad, I think it would help to be able to look back I think it could help to look back and see that, no, I'm not crazy. These things happened. And you've most likely tried to put a nice uh, shine, maybe a, a, a matte finish, a gloss over a lot of these things that happen, if you can remember them at all. But, but remembering them is part of your healing and, and being able to recognize that my body is trying to tell me something and I can't just keep shoving all this stuff away. Jot some of those things down. And then over time, I think that practice alone can help you clarify your thoughts. It'll help you strengthen your understanding of your own worth and maybe guide you as you're starting to set those boundaries that will hopefully eventually get to this place where it protects and, and helps you respect your own emotional well-being. And then find help. 
as a therapist, I think it's a great idea to seek professional help, but you can also find supportive communities, whether online, in person, that focus on your emotional health, your recovery from controlling or, or emotionally neglectful relationships. And that's where maybe right now we need to go for the validation or understanding or shared experiences because that can help remind you you're not alone. And it can be scary to enter into a group, but it is one of the most healing things that you can be a part of. And then truly do look for that professional help if you if you need it, which it never hurts. And then remember that sharing your story, hearing others, that is part of the healing process. It is empowering. Let's wrap this thing up. It's okay to seek out those relationships that truly reflect what we value, respect, empathy, mutual reciprocity, genuine connection. And then the acceptance that you're here and in order to, to get the tools that you're going to need to become the very best version of you, you had to go through some of these things to then even know that you needed change. So it, it, it doesn't sound like a great sales pitch for life, but then now that you're here and that happened and now you're on this path of, of healing, I promise that you just keep stick it, staying down this path and raising that baseline and get that PhD in gaslighting, get out of unproductive conversations, set healthy boundaries and realize that there's nothing you can do or say that will cause the other person to have that aha moment or epiphany. And you're going to start finding yourself in a place where what it feels like to be you is you're a pretty good hang. It's a, it's a good time. Here's to moving forward. You're on a path of discovery, enlightenment. You are absolutely worthy of love, of respect, of being heard and valued. You are enough, period, end of story. You have everything you need already bundled up inside of you. Uh, and this life, in my opinion, is the opportunity to unlock all those wonderful, amazing things that make up who you are. And, and while ideally that would be done in a mutually reciprocal relationship, we don't have those crystal balls when we're getting into relationships. We don't know what we don't know as we navigate life. And then things come up and we have an opportunity for growth. Here's to that growth. Taking us out per usual, the, the wonderful, the talented Aurora Florence with her song. It's wonderful because on the path that you're on, trust me, eventually it will be. Just hang in there.